when Mike asked me to speak, my, um, my first reaction was, well, can you see your way to giving me a series of perhaps 22-hour lectures? Because that's what I'm going to require to do justice to the material. And by the material, I mean these things, or these things, the male disadvantages. Well, hard, that was hardly a practical proposition, but you take my point, there's a lot to say. So all I'm going to be able to do today in... Oh, sorry. All I'm going to be able to do today in 45 minutes uh, is give you a few illustrations. Okay. But before I do that, a couple of preliminaries. Firstly, identity politics. Surely the curse of our time. There's a real risk that I'll be taken for yet another identity politician with my favoured identity group being males, but that isn't so. And the easiest way to refute it, I think, is with this quote from the very heart of identity politics. Equality does not mean treating everyone the same. <laughs> well, you may laugh, and of course I don't agree with that principle, but be aware that that principle is firmly embedded explicitly in our judicial processes. The second issue is victimhood, because there are some people, even people who otherwise tend to be of sound opinion, who will say that if you talk about these things, these male disadvantages, that actually you're just playing at victimhood Olympics. Well, that isn't true either. Uh, and the reason is uh, simple and very important, and it's this. It's because almost no one gives a shit about these things. So there's no uh, brownie points to be had in talking about them. There's no uh, moral cachet in the exercise. All you'll get for your trouble is condemnation and probably accusations of misogyny. And where's the victimhood bonus in that? So actually, all that, people, um, all that people really mean if they throw victimhood Olympics at you in talking about these things, what they really mean is shut up. We don't want to talk about those things. So let's talk about them then. <laughs> and let's start with criminal justice. And I'll make this brief because Jordan Holbrook's going to be giving a whole talk on this. But two years ago... Um, MP Philip Davis stood in this spot and gave us a talk on men and women in, in prison. And the burden of his talk was that, contrary to what many people believe, it's actually men and not women that are treated more harshly in the criminal justice system. For his pains, he was afterwards vilified in social media and a number of prominent feminists had uh, articles published in the press purporting to refute his position. Well, I took the trouble to examine closely a couple of those purported refutations, comparing their claims against Ministry of Justice data, as I do. Uh, and they were, frankly, a litany of untruth. I can sense your amazement. <laughs> um, oh, yes, is it still not loud enough? I apologize. I'll get closer. Um, but the reason why I return to this topic is because just a couple of months after Philip Davis gave his talk and there was a furore in the press, the Ministry of Justice themselves issued a report to absolutely no media interest, whose conclusion was this. Under similar criminal circumstances, the odds of imprisonment for males is 88% higher than for females. And I stress that this analysis by the MOJ was based on, it was actually multivariate logistic regression, which controlled for many variables, of which one, most importantly, was offence category. Now, the MOJ didn't look at sentence length. They only looked at probability of being sent to prison. But I can assure you, because I've looked at it, uh, 
uh, that if you looked at that, you'd find a similar level of gender disparity in sentence length. So the big picture on criminal justice is this. Every year, about three times more men are convicted than women. And if you look at just indictable offences, which are the more serious offences, it's just under six times more men are convicted than women. But there are 21 times more men in prison in the UK. And that gap between the factor of six and the factor of 21 is explicable in terms of the gender disparities I've alluded to. Now, on that basis, I have claimed in the past um, that there's a, a penalty for being male in imprisonment. In other words, that, that ge those gender disparities are not just disparities, but actual bias. Any controversy that there might have been about that interpretation is now at an end. It's at an end because the government have recently made, made it clear that you, whether or not you're sentenced to prison and how long you, well, whether or not you're sentenced to prison will now be explicitly dependent on sex. Last month, uh, Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, David Gork, announced that the new policy will be to avoid custodial sentences for women, except as a last resort. Sorry? Okay. I thought you were objecting. <laughs> Uh, it is remarkable, though, and you're right to express that, because the, 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 the remarkable thing is that there was no outcry from the general public, so, and it's remarkable that's the case. Uh, this, this announcement came together with the announcement that the plan to build five new community prisons for women, essentially in replacement for Holloway, which closed a couple of years ago, had been scrapped, and yet the build programme for men's prisons, uh, extending the capacity for men in prison for another 10,000 or so, that continues. Now, I have no particular view on punishment. Um, if the government wished to pursue a line of putting fewer people in prison, then that's fine by me. Or even alternatively, if they wish to pursue a line of putting more people in prison. My only view on punishment is you should be punished for what you have done, not for what you are. So your likelihood of being sent to prison should not depend on your race or your religion or your sex. And I think most people would agree with that. And yet, in practice, and now in policy, what we actually have is compassion for women and punishment for men, which is rather redolent of what Karen was saying about compassion in the context of men. Now, feminists might, um, feminists might try to rationalize this position in terms of unequal power relations or some such phrase. Well, let's have a look at that then. The head of state in the UK, as you, I'm sure you're aware, has been a woman for 66 years. Our Prime Minister is a woman. The head of the most powerful police force in the land, the Metropolitan Police, is a woman. The most senior judge in the land, the President of the Supreme Court, is a woman. And still, as we speak, though hopefully not for much longer, the Director of Public Prosecutions is a woman. So the, the claim that it all comes down to power relations really ha um, doesn't hold water, uh, if it ever did, but it certainly doesn't now. And of course, I haven't even mentioned false allegations, and I haven't mentioned the seeming meltdown of our criminal justice processes that's become apparent even to the general public over the last year. Uh, incidentally, the, the stock press information on that is that the, um, the Parliamentary Justice uh, Committee, 
published their report on disclosure this morning, so that's now out. I haven't had time to read it. But there are some um, interesting things in there. Alison Saunders doesn't um, exactly come out of it well, inevitably. Um, but there's quite a few other uh, bits and pieces in there. For example, the CPS was trying to do a damage limitation exercise in restrict, uh, restricting the investigations to Crown Court cases, but that report has come out clearly recommending that magistrates' courts have to be included as well. So that, that report is going to be worth a detailed, detailed scrutiny. Now, as a matter of um, as a matter of personal biography, it was when I realised, perhaps about five years ago now, that the the feminist animus towards males had no lower age limit. That I realised that remaining silent on these issues was no longer morally justifiable, and that's when I took to blogging. And let me illustrate that with an issue which is it's, it's quite a minor thing but telling I think. As of April this year there were 913 boys and 27 girls in the secure estate in England and Wales, in other words child prisoners. In that month Anne Longfield, the Children's Commissioner for England, decided she was going to visit some of these children in prison to learn about their lives before entering custody and to understand the factors that led to them being imprisoned and what, if anything, could have been done to change their life trajectory. Now that's perfectly laudable. It's exactly the sort of thing a children's commissioner should do. I have no problem with it, apart from one thing, and that is the ten children she chose to visit were all girls. Now, a few years ago I would have refused to read anything into that, but not any longer because this is part of a persistent trend and the, the mindset behind it is clear. It's if girls are in trouble, it's because society's let them down and they deserve our compassion and our assistance. Well, I have no difficulty with that. What I have a difficulty with is the same compassion is denied to boys, even when the odds are 913 boys to 27 girls, and that's why I'm here. Turning now to education, it's well known that boys are falling behind at school, uh, and unlike decades ago, when boys tended to catch up with girls by the age of 16 or so, the gender gap now gets steadily bigger um, as boys and girls go through their schooling. You wouldn't always get that impression from the newspapers, though. These are some of the headlines you would have read in last A-level results day. Boys beat girls to top grades for the first time in 17 years. Well, misleading is an understatement. The actual reality is that girls were awarded about 60,000 more of the top grades than boys. Um, and with the, as a result of that, 100,000 more young women than young men apply to universities in the UK everywhere, uh, every year, and about 71,000 actually start, excess actually start. Now, if you look at, um, if you look at subjects, the position on education in universities is quite stark. Women actually dominate in 70% of subjects now. There's about 36% more uh, women than, than men as undergraduates now. So women dominate in 70% in of subjects. Women actually dominate in STEM, if you spell STEM with two M's. In other words, science, technology, engineering, maths, medicine, and subjects allied to medicine. Women also dominate in the pure sciences. So actually, men only dominate in the T, the E, and the first M of STEM. And if you add to that's technology, uh, engineering, and maths. And if you add to that architecture, you've got the totality of subjects in which men are, are dominant. <coughs> 
in pretty much all other subjects, women are dominant and very often emphatically dominant. So in medicine and dentistry, women outnumber men by 50%. Uh, in biological sciences, women outnumber men by 50%. In social sciences, by 60%. In art and design, by 80%. Women even dominate in agricultural sciences. There are twice as many women now as men reading law. So it's a good job there's no bias in the criminal justice system then. <laughs> Three times as many women as men. Um, studying languages and literature, four times as many in veterinary science, six times as many women as men in teaching, or teaching educational studies. So good job there's no bias in the educational system as well. And of course nine times as many in nursing. But the narrative of course is always and only we must get more women in STEM. And it really is the only narrative, and I'll demonstrate that. In 2015, Mike raised a Freedom of Information Act, uh, Act query with the Department for Education. He asked whether they recognized boys' underachievement as a problem to be addressed, and if so, what initiatives were in place. The answer essentially was no and nothing. In 2016, the Department for Education published a white paper, that's a government policy document, entitled Education Excellence Everywhere. It was exclusively concerned with the geographical variation in educational attainment. Now, there's nothing wrong with looking at the geographical variation in educational attainment. There wouldn't be anything wrong in looking at the socio-economic variation either. But both of those things are smaller than the gender dependence of educational attainment. And yet in that white paper, the only mention, the only mention of gender was this. We will continue to address the gender gap in STEM subjects, supporting our ambition to narrow the gender pay gap and are committed to increasing the proportion of entries by girls in science and math subjects. Recall that girls actually dominate in science. When this report was published, it's worth noting that the Minister for Education was also the Minister for Women and Equalities. Is it playing at victimhood Olympics to object to an allocation of concern which is so wildly at odds with the evidence? Then earlier this year, we had the Children's Commissioner uh, for England, and Longfield, of whom we've already heard, issue a report growing up north, which again addressed only the geographical variation of educational attainment. And the only mention of gender in that report was, we know girls outperform boys throughout school, but are paid less as adults. It's very important that Regeneration strategies speak to girls' aspirations. So you see, once again, the attempt is being made to eclipse the education issue behind a more favoured political narrative in respect of pay and employment. Then in 2012, a report commissioned by the all-party parliamentary literacy group, the Boys' Reading Commission, observed the predominantly female makeup of the school and children's workforce could mean that their knowledge of books and reading materials could lead them to have a bias towards materials which suited girls' interests. It could well be that the teacher's gender could influence the extent to which they effectively promote books and reading materials that are attractive to boys. Interestingly, one survey respondent who understood the need to promote reading materials that reflect the interests of boys, at the same time made clear her discomfort with these interests. Quote, We try to work from their interests, no matter how banal, disgusting or undesirable. <laughs> 
Might such attitudes be part of the problem? Turning now to healthcare. It's well known that men can expect, on average, a shorter life than women. But what lies behind that is an enormous gap in the premature death rate, as this graph shows. Even very young boys and male babies have a, a probability of dying that's tens of percent greater than females the same age. And by the time that young men reach their early 20s, they're three times more likely to die than a young woman the same age. Men are 78%, 78% more likely to die than women before the age of 45. And yes, the leading cause of that is suicide, I've checked. But men remain 50% more likely to die than women until they're well past retirement age. By far the most significant causes of men's premature death, defined as death before the age of 75, are cardiovascular diseases and cancers. And yet in the context of the pay gap, the Minister for Health and Social Care, Caroline Dininage, has seen fit recently to refer to the NHS as the National He Service. The National He Service. Really. Well, perhaps the Minister would do well to focus more on the service users of the NHS, you know, people that are dying, that sort of thing, rather than regarding the NHS merely as a vehicle for female empowerment. This is the NHS, after all, which is still withholding the HPV vaccine from boys despite the fact that the premature death rate from HPV-induced cancers is the same for males and females, the main difference being that that for males is rapidly increasing. Could be something to do with the vaccine, what do you think? This is the NHS that has no national screening programme for any male-specific cancer. Meanwhile, for all the non-sex-specific cancers, more men die prematurely than women from every single one of them. It doesn't sound like a national he-service to me. In 2015, Professor Dame Sally Davis, our Chief Medical Officer, issued a report entitled the health of the 51% women. Despite polite requests, she's refused to produce an equivalent for men, which is a little odd in view of the evident male disadvantage in terms of health and longevity. I wrote to Sally Davis querying the title. What's that strange 51% doing in there? Is it some sort of triumphalism? You see, my puzzlement is that it, she seems to be advertising her own failure. My point being that at, at birth, it's roughly 51% of babies that are male, and the gender ratio only swaps round in the general population because of the higher male death rate. And that would be predominantly due, due to cardiovascular diseases and cancers, which would be firmly within the bailiwick of the chief medical officer, so you take my point, she's advertising her own failure. Well, she didn't do me the honour of a reply, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, but I think I understand now. I think I understand why uh, an equivalent of that report isn't required for men. You see, if you, if you look at the first two chapters... Of, of the report, the health of the 51% women, what you find is, and brace yourselves, what you find is that the first one is on violence against women and girls, and the second is on female genital mutilation. So you see that explains why no equivalent is required for men, doesn't it? Because men are not victims of violence, and men don't suffer from genital mutilation. I think Stephen Svoboda might have a different view on that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Chapter 12 of that report, The Health of the 51% Women, takes a human rights view approach to women's health, fair enough, and it lists a number of human rights, of which these four are just an illustration. Well, I'm no moral philosopher, but Kant was, and I think that his, his categorical imperative has something to say about the requirement for moral principles to be universal in their application. In other words, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So you could, uh, you could expand at some length on the, uh, the implications of those human rights for men. But time being short, let's concentrate just on that last one. The right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress. And let's talk about DNA testing then and paternity fraud. When it comes to a lack of basic rights, how about this one? In the UK, the men have no, men have no legal right to know whether a child is or is not theirs. When cheap and reliable home DNA testing kits first became available, it was remarkable how quickly the legislature acted to prevent and frustrate men actually availing themselves of it. The 2004 Human Tissues Act makes it illegal to hold human tissue with the intention of doing a DNA test without suitable consent. Well, a young child cannot consent only someone with parental responsibility can consent on behalf of the child, and that always includes the mother. So a man that does not have parental responsibility has no legal right to find out whether a child is or is not his, and cannot do so unless the mother um, wishes him to find out. So men are being denied the right to the benefits of scientific progress, an issue which our chief medical officer has identified as a human right. And that again is why I'm here. Now I recall Mike being on a radio show two or three years ago discussing paternity fraud and the female presenter expressed her horror that the rate of missed paternity might be as high as 2%. Mm quite. Now, there's a lot of data on this, contrary to what some people believe. I've got a database of about 200 reports, and I've not even renewed it recently, so there'll be more now. Um, you have to be very careful, of course, to distinguish between those cases where there's prior suspicion or paternity is being particularly challenged from cases where that's not so. And it's no surprise that if you examine that first class of case, you get a very high rate of missed paternity, 25% in my database. But of more interest is if you look at all the other data. And the average of my database gives you 10% with a median of 6%. Now what really aggravates me in this subject is the line taken by people who refer to themselves as medical ethicists. I do wonder who it is that vets whether these so-called ethicists are actually ethical, because they're pursuing a line that genes don't matter, not when it comes to fathers, that is. Here's some quotes. Dr. Anna Smadgdor. DNA paternity testing overvalues the importance of genetic relationships, and that's why we think of it as fraud. The issue should not be whose genes are in this child. We should have a situation in which people didn't think about genes at all. Heather Draper. Cases of misattributed paternity produce the same distorted and thin view of what it means to be a father that paternity testing assumes and underscores a trend that is not in the interests of the children. Now, if, if these women truly believed their own words, we could dispense with those risk tags that newborn babies wear in maternity wards. 
we could send mothers home with any baby because they're all the same. <laughs> but they will have no intention of uh, applying these same views to mothers. They'll not be accusing women who prefer to raise their own child of having a thin view of motherhood. They fail the categorical imperative and betray themselves as ethical frauds. And as for not being in the best interests of the child, are these people really medically qualified? Have they not considered that the child will be medically disadvantaged all his or her life by being ignorant of their correct father's true health history? And it's worth bearing in mind that 10% or 6% figure. That means, let's call it 6%. It means 6% of the whole population are suffering from uh, um, a misunderstanding as to who their father is. And consider what that means in terms of medical disadvantage alone, let alone everything else. So, is this a case of the mother's interests trumping the interests of the child, do you think? And that brings me, of course, to the family courts. The family courts are surely the epicentre of male disadvantage, but perhaps even more importantly, they're an epicentre of children's disadvantage. Uh, it's actually with the deepest trepidation that I approach this subject, and I have to say I've not personally had any dealings with the family courts, thank God. So I'll say only a very little. Uh, Nick Langford will be saying much more. Every year in the UK, there's around 45,000 Children's Act private family law cases in England and Wales. Half of these involve allegations of domestic abuse. I'll, I'll say that again. Half of them involve allegations of domestic abuse. This is hardly surprising when such allegations function as a fast track to securing the claimant's wishes, including the acquisition of legal aid. A trivially small proportion of these domestic abuse allegations in the family courts are ever subject to any real investigation. Everyone involved in the process, the lawyers, the judges, the social workers, they all know that fabrication of abuse claims is endemic. It's a game, though a sick game and a rigged game. Alienation is a common concomitant of child arrangement disputes. It's a form of child abuse consisting of an induced mental health issue. Alienation is a condition which has been virtually created by the way our society addresses parental separation. It's a problem created by society which previously barely existed. Around 90 to 95 percent of non-resident parents of fathers and consequently about this percentage of alienated parents of fathers, simply because the courts ensure that it's the mothers who have the opportunity to do the alienating. In 2016, Sarah Parsons, principal social worker and assistant director of CAFCAS, stated that parental alienation is responsible for around 80% of the most intransigent cases that come before the courts. False allegations are strongly linked to cases of alienation. Alienation expert and counselling psychologist Dr Sue Whitcomb has estimated from a sample of 54 of her clients that 81% of alienation cases involve fal false allegations of child abuse. Regrettably, time is too short to go into the evidence that fathers as well as mothers are beneficial to child outcomes. I merely allude briefly, by this very busy uh, slide, to the fact that there's a growing body of research support, not merely for a correlation between fatherlessness and adverse outcomes for children, but that this correlation is actually causal, which is a rare claim in social science circles. I also allude only very briefly to the issue of parental conflict and outcomes for children. There's a de facto premise in the family courts. 
that where there's a high level of conflict between the parents, the children's best interests are served by restricting or eliminating entirely contact with one parent. But it isn't so. For example, Linda Nielsen has carried out a careful review of the literature and concluded that joint physical custody is associated with better outcomes for children than sole physical custody, even when conflict is low. Not low, yes, quite. I'm glad you're awake. That was, that was of course, a test. The key principle in the family court is that the best interests of the child are paramount. But the courts are dramatically failing to live by that dictum, in large part because of a lazy assumption which conflates the best interests of the child with the wishes of the mother. The courts fail to abide by the paramountcy principle in their promotion of parental strife, their promotion of domestic abuse allegations, their promotion of alienation, their promotion of fatherlessness, and their complete lack of knowledge of the outcomes of their own decisions. As an illustration of the destructive skirmishes that arise when lobby groups jockey for strategic advantage in the family courts, consider this episode. In 2016, Women's Aid produced a report, 19 Child Homicides, which trawled 10 years of serious case reviews to identify a dozen cases of fathers killing their children while on contact visit. Polly Neat, who was then the CEO of Women's Aid, stated that, we have launched the campaign to stop avoidable child deaths as a result of unsafe child contact with dangerous perpetrators of domestic violence. Judge for yourself the significance of this campaign objective given the prevalence of false accusations of domestic abuse in the family courts. The strategy is to raise the spectre that every father appearing in the courts against whom an accusation is made, and that means half of them, is likely to be a murderer, thus disenfranchising him from meaningful involvement in his child's life thereafter. The success of this strategy is the fruit of decades of misandry. Denigration is the handmaiden of discrimination. Women's Aid's campaign was well organised and planned. MPs were lobbied in advance. They won a debate in Parliament. It was not a debate. A debate has two sides. It was a monoculture of opinion, that of women's aid. The blame here, though, lies with the MPs. A lobby group cannot be expected to be balanced, but MPs are under an obligation to represent everyone fairly and are assumed to be intelligent enough to seek balance. Instead, it appears that our Parliament can very easily be led by the nose by a lobby group which presses the right emotional buttons. Any MPs who might have had reservations lack the moral fibre to speak up. Now, the cases Women's Aid identified were real and terrible, but they represented an extreme degree of cherry-picking. I wondered what I might find if I looked through all the serious case reviews. So I did. Not an edifying task. I identified not just 19 child killings in 10 years, but 332 child killings in seven years. Mothers, I discovered, were more often responsible for a child death than fathers and male partners combined. Single mothers were the demographic most likely to be responsible for the deaths of children. And what are we to conclude from this? That mothers are dangerous to their children? Clearly not, for that would be preposterous. But that would be the equivalent of women's aid strategy for fathers. <laughs> 
The purpose of my exercise was only to expose the fraudulence of that strategy by showing how it could be turned around if one were willing to embrace the same mendacious folly. The truth is that these terrible cases tell us absolutely nothing about the bulk of cases going through the courts. Having committed the ultimate PC sin of claiming that mothers are at least equally responsible for child deaths as men, I was rather surprised when substantial support for this contention came from a most unexpected source, CAFCAS, the Children and Family Court Advisory and Support Service. Their report, learning from CAFCAS submissions to serious case reviews, was made publicly available last November. Its conclusions were broadly consistent with my own. As follows, men and women were suspected perpetrators of a similar number of incidents of homicide, and we're talking about child homicides here. Almost all allegations of domestic abuse were against men, usually fathers. In almost half of these cases, the person thought to have killed or harmed the child was not the alleged domestic abuse perpetrator. Serious case review submissions showed that in some cases, the risk posed by the alleged violent adult may have masked the risk posed by the other parent. I hardly dare believe that some semblance of reason might be beginning to emerge. Now I want to close now on a subject that might seem off topic but isn't. This year we celebrate the centenary of the 1918 Representation of the People Act. Predictably it's being celebrated as the act which gave the vote of parliamentary vote to the majority of women for the first time. Well, there's nothing wrong with celebrating that, but what's, what is wrong is celebrating only that, because that is not the most fundamental aspect of that act. And no, I do not only refer to the fact that that act also enfranchised a far larger number of men than any other previous act, though that is also true. I refer to something more fundamental. The necessity to redefine the parliamentary electoral role arose because the existing property-based franchise had been shot to pieces by the dislocation of millions of men in World War I. The primary purpose of the 1918 Act was to give the vote to disenfranchised working-class men because to withhold the vote any longer had become insupportable in view of the mayhem of World War I. The dominant sentiment which controlled the direction of the new franchise was, if they are fit to fight, they're fit to vote. World War I ended the age-old class antagonism which had withheld political representation from the majority of working class men until that time. Prior to 1918, democracy was a dirty word. The 1918 Act was the final triumph of the democratic principle that all adult citizens should enjoy equal political influence. This was the culmination of the entirety of history until that time. It represents the triumph of the recognition of the individual rather than the class identity group to which he or she belonged, which is why these observations are so pertinent. This dissolution of the age-old class antagonism came about as a result of the slaughter of men in World War I, but now we're told that that act is just about women. If I wished to be inflammatory, heaven forbid, I could argue that the vote for women was bought with men's lives, and whilst that would hardly be a fully rounded depiction of the history, nor is it entirely untrue unlike the suffragette mythology, which is entirely untrue. It's surely a noble and uplifting thing, and I can think of little more genuinely worthy of celebration than the fact that such a desirable egalitarian advance, the triumph of the democratic principle, the triumph of the individual, arose from the horror of the trenches. But this has been forgotten. It has been eclipsed, 
by the identity group perspective of the suffragette mythology. We are ostensibly celebrating the 1918 Act, but in reality, we are participating in neglecting its true significance. And just how disturbed should we be that not only is the triumph of the democratic principle now deemed unworthy of note, but the crucial role of men in bringing that about has been written out of popular history. Thank you.